Three, two, one, go. Hello, hello. This is Ignacy Chuchek from Portal Games. And this is the pod father of gaming, Stephen Bonacore. <laughs> you are listening to Board Games Insider, episode 257. And we're recording this on December 1st, 2022. Board Games Insider is a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. And this is PAX Unplugged Week. I'm in cold, rainy Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I'm cranky that I'm not back in the warmth of Florida, which is literally 50 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. But I can take solace in the fact that not only is this Floridian suffering from the terrible weather, but so is Tom Vassell. Tom and his crew are here. I have not seen him yet. Um, the convention actually hasn't started yet. Uh, so it's we're really early. Uh, tomorrow is the actual first day, three-day convention. Big convention, as we all know, right? Second biggest in the United States uh, for board gaming. That is why you complaining on the weather makes no sense because I was <laughs> once at Pax and Plug. The convention was amazing. The food was amazing. The city is beautiful. There's lots of things to you can go sightseeing. Yep. I had no time for that, but I regret that. So stop whining. You're at the best place to be this weekend on the planet Earth. That's, Everybody is jealous about that. That's pretty pretty true. This is going to be a <laughs> lot of fun. I already started last night uh, uh, going to a two, two epic pubs uh and had beer and and some fun pub food in two different places last night with my friends matt and jenny latham wonderful people anyhow ignasi what's happening at portal games uh, as we reported uh, last week uh we finished uh, our our catalog for this year the brazil was our last release of this year so if you listen in these episodes, all these episodes of podcast uh, during the whole year, yes, we released Gutenberg Amazing Euro game. We released Batman Everybody Lies Story Driven Game. We released Basilica for two players. We released Wrath to the Lighthouse solo campaign. And now we finally released the Brazil 4X game. A beautiful components production value is just mind blowing. The gameplay is quick. I was spending, I spent the whole month in America promoting the game, uh, visiting different states, uh, game stores, conventions, the Dice Tower, Gen Con. Everybody loved the game. And I already see on social media people enjoying the game. So uh, if you're looking for the gift for yourself, Brazil might be the best pick at the end of the year. So I'm strongly recommending to check it out. Brazil in stores and go to your local game store, whatever city you are living in, go to the owner and said, I want on your shelf, games from Portal Games. I want on your shelf Brazil because I want to buy it. So this is my message about the new products. As for the brag of the week, for the past four weeks, I was bragging about me being a guest speaker on various conventions because it was a convention season in Poland. And now I'm bragging about something completely dif uh, different and completely crazy. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Bonacor, do you know uh, what it is fanzine? A fanzine, yes, of course, a uh, fan-run magazine publication, and you are now showing me. I did a, one. You did your own fanzine called yeah. Sherwood. Sherwood, it's a uh, forty-eight pages of black and white old-school fanzine for fans of gaming and fantasy and science fiction alike in the old good nineties. I printed in a small print run just for friends uh, and uh, hardcore fans. I'm uh, so proud. This is like a super small project. I did it in the during the weekends and in the evenings. It has nothing to do with Portal Games. It's just a old school, freaking amazing fanzine uh, here in Poland. So this is my brag of the week. I'm crazy and I'm proud of it. Does it have um um uh, like fiction in it? Is that what it yes, is? Like of course we have. Of course every fanzine have to have this fan fiction. So we have a. a one short story, fan fiction, and we have uh, articles about uh, board games, some reviews. I have here a grid so people can ch choose what's the best science fiction movie, and they are just, you know, playing like all oh, this. Oh, the, have... um, the the Met March Madness yeah, grid yeah. where you, you pick the best science fiction, you yep. have the winner on your you own. Know, oh, very I cool. have I have a crossroad for the fans of science fiction with their questions about the science Cro fiction. Crossword puzzle. Yep. So full blown fanzine. I did it uh, in my spare time. I'm so proud. It has nothing to do with Portal Games. It has nothing to do with the business. It's just for fun, and I'm so proud. Does uh, does the fiction include like a story about two 
publishers, one former publisher in the board gaming industry that act like superheroes and save the day, anything like in, that? In this first issue, no. In the first issue, we have dark fantasy, very <laughs> dark, very sad. But it is a great idea for the second issue. So that was my brag of the week. Very uh, cool. I'm crazy. I did a real, real, real fanzine like in all times in the 90s. Now, my pre-orders are three days, uh, as mentioned. Everything is uh, released. We will have one more release, but it will be digital. Portal Games Digital is finishing uh, working on a one thing, so we'll announce it in a few a few days. Uh, but basically, our catalog is already released. And what's happening uh, in the, at HQ, what are we are doing here? So first of all, we published update on 11 on our game found cam campaign. So we are updating all the funds from different countries, as mentioned. Europe already has. 11, but then we have Australia, we have China, Japan, America, etc. etc. Yes, we have Stephen Monaco in Florida. So, yes, uh, update was posted on a game found campaign with the whole schedule of, of the shipping. We also did the update on Thorgal, my new game, a product against new game, uh, adventure game. We'll be talking about it more in the beginning of the next year. So, but if you are following Portal Games, go to the Thorgal update. Uh, we are working right now on uh, FAQ for Raft of the Lighthouse. Unfortunately, there is a uh, lot of uh, questions. There are some small mistakes in the wording of the of the of the solo campaign. So we are pulling out right now the questions from Board Game Geek, uh, building a PDF FAQ. It will be released uh, this upcoming week. Uh, very sorry for all the fans who already played and had some issues. Uh, sometimes, uh, unfortunately. It goes through the editing, and yet we slip some of the keywords or something like that. So we are fixing it right now on FAQ. And uh, what I'm doing right now, I'm doing like uh, all these notes here in front of me. We are working on a second game of Batman. Earlier this year, we released Batman Everybody Lies. Uh, nice. Great reviews. Thank you for that. And now we are doing a follow-up uh, game that will be released next year. Once again, new cases in Gotham. In this new game, you will we will have new characters you can play like red robin and uh, nice. bad girl and uh, all these awesome bad family characters we will have a uh, new uh, new villains obviously and all the good amazing gotham full of crime and corruption and you will be dealing with this uh, issue so uh, busy preparing a game for the no. next year um, and basically in a free time doing a fanzine and i think it's crazy that's that is amazing that's congratulations on the fanzine that's a very cool little project yep. there and i and <laughs> i don't know if, if people can go get it is it going to be available anywhere i have to like in all good days so most of the fans is i'm just shipping to my friends just so we you know, enjoy it and i put it on my web store here in poland so some okay. people can can buy it obviously but mostly i did it for my you know friends uh, who That's were nice. geeks with me this 20 years ago and uh, we enjoy very uh, cool. being sentimental and memories about the old fandom very very cool so you mentioned 11 by the way and uh, i think this is a good segue into the fact that the usa of course or in the, the final 16, <laughs> of course, easily making it into the final 16. Poland made it on their fair play. They had less yellow cards than, was it Mexico? I forgot who the other, yes, it was. <laughs> Dude, and I was, tr I was trolling Ignacy. <laughs> In, in WhatsApp during the match. It was, a, it, I got to tell you, I mean, honestly, you know, you know, a hundred times more than I do about football. Um, uh, Poland really got outplayed, but it was like potentially the best team in the world, right? I mean, Argentina is in the top three teams in the world. So it was a tough, tough game to, to Here win. Here in Poland, uh, since yesterday uh, evening, there is obviously the nationwide discussion. If we should be happy that we qualified, <laughs> or we should be embarrassed the style we did it that the whole world is making fun of us and uh, there's like how the nation thinks yes we made it and how the nation makes oh my god it was it's, embarrassing it's embarrassing you squeezed they, it was like the fourth or fifth tiebreaker they went yep. down to <laughs> it's like crazy but hey you're in and in in american so football funny, we have a funny funny story uh, we don't go too much in the football but in the final quarter of the match one of our players got the yellow card and due to the fair play we got that we lose the freaking tiebreaker and the coach took him from the from the pitch just to not have another yellow card so we were now fighting to even win this stupid tiebreaker that was oh, embarrassing that was that's crazy um 
it was awesome. It was just, it was just awesome. But you know, we have a, we have an expression in American football, any given Sunday, yep. meaning right. Fo- American football is mostly played on Sundays. And that means that any really, when it comes down to it, even if you're one's a big favorite, it, it comes down to at any moment, human beings could, could rise to the occasion and win. So yes, so Poland's got a chance. USA has got a chance, obviously not favored to win, but good luck to both of those teams, especially we will be rooting for them. Over at the pod, father of gaming, I'm going to mention again, the World Series of Board Gaming 2023. I've been invited again to be the VIP, one of the VIPs for next year. uh, And I'm offering you a discount code if you sign up. If you use the code podfather on checkout, not only do you get $40 off, but I'm going to buy you a beer too. If you tell me you did that using my code in Essen, in Essen, in in Las Vegas in uh, September of next year. So go to WSBG Vegas, sign up for either the quadruple ring or stay and play packages. Use the code podfather for $40 off and you get a beer from me. I hope you do it. It was so much fun and it's going to be an even better event as we move forward year after year. Other things going on here. It's been you know, lots and lots of travel. So uh, as I mentioned, I was in BGG Con, I think last time we recorded. I've been in New Jersey <clears throat> for like 10 days with my, with my mother, which is... That's, we recorded the last time from your house, yep. That's right. And we recorded there from mom's house and no no uh, deaths were reported uh, between at the Bonacore family gatherings. That was a good thing. Um, I got a good chance to see all of my friends. It was amazing. So that was so much fun. Uh, and now, as I mentioned, it's uh, it's PAX U week. And now I get to see the industry again for one final hurrah before the holidays. Uh, and and as you said, I should not complain about this crappy weather here because I'm also in this amazing suite at the Marriott downtown. I use some of these like free suite nights that Marriott gave me. And this room is ridiculously big. You see the TV behind me there? It has my logo on it. So people who watch this can see the logo it's like it's like CNN over here now. This is going to become Podfather Studios, and maybe I'll do some other recordings and make that even look better. Uh, so anyway, we're gonna have a great time this year. Like you said, great food in this area. I mean, wonderful ethnic foods in downtown Philadelphia, uh, and a wonder, amazing amount of American history down here too. Um, and I've I've seen it way back in the in the day. But if anybody is down here, uh, they should always go check that out. It is a it is a blast. With saying all of that. Let's get over to the event deck. All right. So the first thing uh, is something that literally broke like two days ago. And I, and I brought it to the top of the news because this had to be said terraforming Mars board game set for a screen adaptation from cobalt night studios exclusive on deadline.com. This came out just two days ago. Um, Nascent. That means very young, like baby. Uh, An ASEAN production company, Cobalt Knight, which was founded by video game executives Christopher Kaminsky and Christopher Knox, have optioned the screen rights to the game Terraforming Mars, which has sold, this is a very interesting um, thing that we we find out from this, has sold over 1.5 million copies. The company is leaning towards a series, but also open for a feature take on the strategy game, which sees players compete to use resources and innovative technology to make the red planet habitable. Um, Cobalt Knight was founded to develop a slate of TV and film projects based on video games, board games, manga, comic books, short novels. Um, One of the things, and I, by the way, of course, I had to reach out to Frick's games to see if they would tell me anything else. And uh, I've given, uh, been given permission to spread the news far and wide that What's cool about this is it's been optioned. Now, that means in, in, in Hollywood terms that they have the rights to do it, but they don't, have, they, they don't have to do it. They have X period of time to do it. Um, and many, many things. I mean, I would say 20 to 1. For every 20 things that are optioned, one of those things sees the light of day in whatever media that it comes out in. Um, they have a one-year option, which is very interesting. So only one year to to get a contract, essentially, 
with a major studio, right? So they're a production like a production company or something like that. They're, they're going to create a treatment and then they got to go out to Paramount or to MGM or some big studio to actually say, we got this thing, we want to do this, you want to back us. Um, I think that's really cool because we'll know in a year, hopefully, we'll know something is happening or not happening, in which case, well, okay, it was great to think about, you know, this kind of stuff. So I was totally crazy excited about this. Yeah, we all are. Uh, like, as you just said, uh, it is no super likely it will happen. But if it happens, it's like a freaking amazing. We, we, we already were super geek out when there was a news about, you know, new D&D movie. And now Terraforming Mars, if it would happen, it would be amazing. Uh, my first Martian, this famous game that was a terrible rule book and terrible feedback, unfortunately, it uh, was based on the, Mar the Martian with Matt Demont. Demont. Mm -hmm. um, and now a reverse story. Maybe there will be a movie with Matt Damon based on the board game. Much yeah. more cool, right? <laughs> that is very, uh, very cool possibility. So uh, we will see. Fingers crossed. Uh, I, I love the theme. I love the game. Uh, I love all the also literature about math. Of course, everybody knows that I was super geeky about the topic. So if there is a chance for that movie, I'm going to the cinema. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Very, very cool. And so, and this is, this was truly news in like, and it was even on IMDb news too, but there was also a rumor that came out at the same time. It's Stephen Bonacore has been cast in the role of eccentric sponsor. It's just a rumor. So I just want to, you know, I just, I heard this. I don't know who told me, might've been me, but that's possible. We don't want to spread the rumors, but <laughs> this one seems legit. So we are it's, giving it a chance, right? Le it's legit. It's absolutely legit. So the next one, I, I can't go into too deeply because it's one of those like um, um, kind of opinion articles and it, it goes it goes pretty deep into its detail. But Scott Thorne, we quote his articles, his columns that come out on ICV2.com often. Um, and he talked about it's a, a map holiday time for Asthma Day. So essentially, Asthma Day, which has a map, that means minimum advertised pricing. So uh, stores... Be, be it online or um, or uh, you know local stores, they can't advertise uh, lower prices than what Asthma Day has set. It's a, and it's twenty percent is what they say. So, so if a game is a hundred dollars, they can only advertise eighty dollars. I just do the math really really easy. But during this time of year, they allow for the retailers across the board to advertise lower prices. The way that you know. Uh, we all run Black Friday sales and things like that. So they have done this. And they've also made some, so that's a one thing, but they also made some changes to what's called their best sellers program starting uh, in 2023. No longer will participating stores receive free, free freight on orders, um, $50 credit each month toward the purchase of games, and a free best seller set of for a set of shelves upon enrollment. Instead, under the new terms, participants in the program will receive one, it will receive additionally 1% off MSRP on most Asthma Day products, priority allocation, listing on Asthma Day store locator, and enrollment in the Hobby Next program. Although not confirmed by Asthma Day, I have heard from several sources that free shipping kicks in at $500. So they're making these big changes um, which may, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a guess here, is not in the best interest of the retailers. It's in the best interest of Asthma Day. That's sort of the way things end up creeping back and forth. As we, as we all know, they've got a lot of power, so they're gonna use it on some level. It's gonna be very interesting to see how it all shakes out. Um, if you out there have been talking to your friendly, you know, friendly local retail stores and have any more insight. You know, post it in our forums, you know, so we can uh, we can chat about what the retailers are thinking about it. Yep, uh, I was, as our listeners remember, always skeptical about asthma getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and, uh, and now we see why I was uh, skeptical, why I was scared. Like now, every store in America, by every store on the world, in the world, it needs to have Ticket to Ride, needs to have Carcassonne, needs to have uh, Kata, needs to have Pandemic in the in, on the shelf, so they have to work with. Uh, Asmodi, uh, so Asmodi can change the terms of the relationship, business relationship, uh, the way they want, and the store will agree and agree 
and yeah. angry because <laughs> the option is either you sell Pandemic, either you sell Brazil. With the whole respect to Ignaz and his small independent portal games, stores wants Pandemic in, in uh, on the shelves. So uh, this is it. Uh, kudos to uh, Public Relation team at Asmo Asmodi, how they put these news in a nice way that the stores will get priority allocation. If every single store in America uses Asmodi as a distributor, and this is the case because they need these games, how you can get priority if you are with everybody? So, yeah, that's, very, very that's, interesting. That's a cool, cool feature to be just one of 500 stores. Yep, absolutely. So this one uh, in the uh, crossover of computing and board gaming, we can now add diplomacy to the game to the list of games that an AI can play as well as humans. Uh, and it's funny, the little, this was on, uh, it was on several different places, but uh, uh, on this website, which is Engadget.com, they have a little bit of a dig at the Russian invasion. It says the tabletop strategy board game we're talking about, not the thing nations pretend to do before invading. Thank you for uh, that little political note there as well. So, um, this is goes into all kinds of various things, but the point of this is that um, we've we've we now have seen computers can beat the best players of chess in the world regularly. They can beat humans at like game like Jeopardy, right? Which is that's astonishing, right? So that's something that the, that the computer has to interpret what is being read to it said to it and then and then and then click a click the button and then respond that's an amazing leap in artificial intelligence and anything else with a with a kind of a finite set of parameters or what computers are good at you know they crunch numbers and they do something but now diplomacy is not that diplomacy is me saying something we're going to be in an alliance now and you'll go attack that thing and i'll support you attacking there so that you help me out later and at some point you gotta lie to win diplomacy you have to lie you have to tell an untruth to get somebody to help you or you or do you people think that you're in an alliance when then you backstab them it's all about the game Diplomacy's little like funny tag is that, you know, destroying friendships since 1959, which that's how old the game is. And that's how, how backstabby it is. It's like the ultimate in backstabbing games. Now, computers can beat humans at this. They ran a simulation uh, where, and, and they did this for a bunch of things. I'm, gonna tr I'm trying to find the actual numbers here. I can't see it in, in this article, but they did it. You know, there was a computer player and, and six human players, and they got together and they played it a bunch of times, and the computer did better than the average human, including negotiating with people, of course, we're talking about, right? Uh, astonishing. Ignacy, I, mean, I don't know how to put it any other way. Just astonishing that this type of game, you know, with the right programming, of course, can be won by a computer. Yeah, we are living in a, in an era when the the word AI is now a common news. We have these AI art created uh, platforms that, that paint the beautiful paintings and everybody's uh, astonished how the computer can paint the beautiful painting. And now we have a computer that can lie. Uh, I think it, it goes faster and faster and faster. And uh, what we were reading as a science fiction novels yeah. 40 years ago, and then we have a computer and then we have yep. internet and then we have iPhone and now we have AI. Yeah. It just speeds up crazy. So, yeah, and uh, I have the, the stats here. It says uh, uh, Meta AI Researchers, that's the company that did this, announced that they had surmounted uh, those machine learning shortcomings with their program Cicero, the first AI to display human level performance in diplomacy. The team trained Cicero on 2.7 billion parameters over the course of 50,000 rounds at webdiplomacy.net, an online version of the game, where it ended up in second place out of 19 participants in a five game league tournament all while doubling up the average score of its opponents amazing 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 that's all i have to say about that and scary 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 
Ignacy wants us to move on, essentially. I'm so sorry because the next one was right up his alley, the next article here. <laughs> it so, will be the highlight for the next one. This will be the highlight. The next one has to do with Gamma. We'll make it the highlight of the next one. Let's get over to strategy and tactics. So Joseph Leone, uh, he's at Leone J. He says, Ignacy, I have read in the recent Moloch Monthly that you enjoy wargaming. Have you ever tried an economic game like the 18xx series? I'm scared of these games. Uh, so I played uh, the Edge of Steam from Martin Wallace. I played the uh, Railroad Tycoon. Uh, but these are like the easier version. This 18xx series, a uh, couple of friends of mine in this area here have them, play them. They invited me to play them, but I'm scared. Uh, most likely at some point in my life, I will try them but they have this reputation of being very long and very difficult games. So still on my to check list. I've played, I've played a few of them. Uh, okay. Not, not well, I'm sure. Uh, but you know, I mean, cause there are people who play these games religiously. I mean, this is their thing. They play, exactly. Exactly. they go to a convention and they'll play 18 XX the whole time they're there. Uh, people at the gathering of friends sit around and play 18 XX a lot. Uh, and just to give it the, perspective for everybody out there these are heavy economic games set around uh trains in the 1860s in fact 1860 i believe is the most famous of the 18xx games but they go back even to earlier like years and of course once you go back to early years not only do, do the economics change in the game but also the types of trains of course that were available and things like that so they're really interesting they are heavy um, but they're not really that hard to play. They're okay. hard to play well at. I would recommend playing 1860. Um, I don't know if you like it, but it's something that you kind of should put into your head. Like, okay, I did that. It was an interesting, interesting experience. Very cool. Fabian Klein, who's at the InSphere. Mr. Bonagor gave me the order to post a question into this very thread. So I will follow his command, but don't complain afterwards. Okay, Fabian, this is a crazy question because I did read this beforehand. Which song would you use to describe your taste in board games when you entered the hobby? And which song would you use for your current taste of board games? I, I don't know. Ignacy, do you have a, a song that would describe your game tastes before? I would, and... I would go with the crazy answer so the beginnings would be some uh, theme songs uh, from Sesam Street when you're just learning everything and you want to learn how to count how to speak how to read how to write so some Sesam Street music and now it would be like uh, some terrible jazz with improvisation and very uh, strange noises because I'm playing now everything in a different uh, genres different areas different uh, types of games. So from the beginnings of Sesam Street, now I ended up as a jazz man. And uh, <laughs> in my private life, I don't listen either to Sesam Street, Sesam Street music either to jazz. So. so I, if I had to say something, I would say the logical song, if you remember that from like the, <laughs> the 80s, 80s, I believe, because I was very into in the beginning of like my kind of gaming or like at least at one point kind of early on, I would like abstracts and like just pure euros and pure information in front of me now i really don't want to play that style of game that much i want to play games with randomness i want to play games with theme i want the theme to tell to to make my game experience better right you see what i mean there's a big difference between like a euro game which just has it's a mechanical exercise how to solve the mechanical puzzle now i'll i'll play betrayal at house on the hill because i just i don't care if the game is like half broken i just want to play it and i want to be that investigator and i'll be out there so i can't tell you which maybe my my new song for my new games would be like the theme from lord of the rings or something like that because it's thematic i don't know fabian you're crazy but he asked another question apparently uh in my perception the pandemic highly increase the use of tabletop simulator and tabletopia sure do you share this impression did you use them more often for gaming compared to pre-covid ignacy i think we did right i mean i think we all got obviously onto whatever platform it was because we weren't going anywhere and i don't like tts it's annoying it's it's more of a physics engine than anything but the ones that implement games well either on a web interface or via steam 
those are are fantastic. Yes, I, I would say that uh, during the COVID, we had a couple of uh, different inventions in our in our in our industry, and I can I can say that there is not much virtual conventions that survived. Like people get okay, we can meet now face to face screw the online conventions but tabletop simulator uh, remained and uh, here in uh, at, at least at the b2b level like for us uh, working in the industry we use uh, tts every week uh, we do a play testing uh, through the tts we present our prototypes to our partners and this is uh, a legit important part now of running a business in board gaming i'm still after all these years i'm still not fan of this uh, solution uh, i'm still struggle you know shuffling these cards and putting these pawns etc etc so it's still difficult for me but all my developers have their prototypes in tts and uh, all my people in the licensing have these uh, links to our games and they present them to our partners so yes the tts remained a thing very important thing in a b2b sphere mm -hmm. now he asked another question some very good questions here how often are you guys specifically contacted by designers to join prototype testings and give your feedback advice not to not to just promote them uh, to to sell them to the company just to give advice um what do you think about and how do you react to such requests coming from established designers you know or unknown designers and Stephen, did your attitude towards such requests change with your retirement um i'll go first um i you know back in the day I had to play prototypes a lot, you know, or or games that, you know, from partners, you know, right? you bring back 50 games from Essen and we play the play like every one of them, or or at least you read them and you're like, oh, no, I don't want this one, but oh, okay, this says something possibly. Let's play it. Oh, this really might let's play it again. So you had to do those things. Um now um I will I will give people some feedback on their games. Um you know, in a mentoring type of setting um, on occasion. I, I try not to do it too often because then it's going to take, you know, then it's going to take away from me enjoying like a convention like this, right? I come here to hang around with people and just play, play games that I, I want to play. Um, if somebody says, you know, I could really use just some guidance on something, I say, you know what, set up a meeting. I'll give you, let's let's set up something online, half hour, you can show me some stuff, and then I'll give you some some feedback on it. Um, but it's better, it's better for me not to take too many of those things, or else my life becomes too much like my, you know, my retired life becomes like my former life. Ignacy? Yeah, for, for me, it's very simple. There are conventions fully dedicated to that, like mm -hmm. uh, Alan Moore's Gathering of Friends, the Bruno Faiduti Gathering of Friends. We had uh, a couple of conventions like that in Poland as well. So when I go there, I'm uh, focused on, yes, I will play test prototypes. I will help other designers. They will help me. And it's like a brainstorming uh, mm -hmm. weekend. And then there's regular conventions, and there is no way that I will play prototype on a regular convention because then I have a different task, different objectives, different goals to achieve at the convention, and I cannot spend uh, two hours playing some prototype because I do have to do uh, seminars, I have to meet with the fans, I have to demo my own games. So uh, either there's a dedicated convention that I'm going there to play test all the time, either there's regular convention and I'm not doing it whatsoever. Super right. simple. Kurt Van Hoyveld, who's Vitruvian Gamer. We know him well. Thanks, Kurt. Area control has never been a favorite mechanic of mine, which is one of the reasons I've never, ever been interested in war games. But since Ignacy and Rodney Smith and one of the Rolling Dice and Taking Names guys are way into these GMT and alike games, I'm starting to get curious. What game or games in this genre would Ignacy advise to play as a complete noob and a skeptic you want to want to in, in, advise good old so, kurt yeah so first of all uh, gmt is not releasing many area control games like area control games are more of our industry mm -hmm. like all these uh, from me cry havoc from colossal games mezzo from uh, asmodi cyclades uh, Eric Lang, Blood Rage, Eric Lang, Rising Sun, Eric Lang, <laughs> Ank, etc. Et so these are area, <laughs> area control games. And yep. from these area control games, I would go either very, very deep into Eric Lang's design, so probably Blood Rage as the most famous, or go classic way and go to Wolfgang Kramer, El Grande. 
Oh, El Grande, Hazard. baby. Oh, yeah. This is, this is, a, this is a game that started area control uh, genre, and this is still up to date. A brilliant game. I have it in my collection. We played it regularly with my friends, and still, after these all 20 years, it's still uh, brilliant. And if you're talking about the GMT games, so basically war games, but not necessarily area control games, I would go with the one of the simplest one and the very famous and very good that is a Commas and Color by Richard Borg. Very then good. Very good. Implemented as a memoir by Days of Wonder. Uh, but the, the first one was uh, Commas and Colors. First was a battle cry. But the most famous is Commas and Colors. It's an ancient theme. You are playing ancient battles. The system is uh, super vivid, dynamic. Things are happening. Uh, elephants are charging. Chariots are charging. Uh, things are happening at the battlefield. So you feel like you're playing the war game, but it's not boring. It's like uh, 45 minutes of just blowing things on the battlefield. It's amazing. So area control, El Grande, or Blood Rage, war game, commas and colors. Those are great, great choices. Um... El Grande was absolutely one of the first games that just got me hooked into the board gaming uh, world. It's so well done. I call it the great, you know, every, every mechanic or genre has its granddaddy, so to speak. And El Grande is that for area control games. Um, and I'm not sure if he meant area control or he really meant like War games. games of games of conflict. So, uh, yes, on the lighter side, you can go also with the Richard Borg game Memoir 44 um, or Battle Cry. Uh, those games all use the same system generally, including right. with um, with all of the commands and colors games that that uh, that. GMT and Richard Borg came out with the 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 ones GMT did were a little heavier than Memoir 44 and Battle Cry. Fantastic games. And funny thing is, I recently got it in my head, um, and I reached out to Richard Borg just like this week, and just to say hello again because I hadn't seen him at a convention in years and stuff like that. And he replied really quickly. And I and I said I found a copy of Red Alert, um, Space warfare um space well, red alert space warfare or something uh it's basically his space battle version of the system the, of the system of commands and colors and he had pitched it to zev and he had pitched it to me back in the day but the game would have cost so much to make and produce both of us said we I, and he said i, I it's got to be like this you got to make it like this this can't be chits this can't be it just wouldn't have been economically feasible, except of course with crowdfunding, things become economically feasible. So he got it to a company who put it up on Kickstarter. It did okay on Kickstarter, um, but it got hit with COVID and all of that kind of stuff, um, uh, you know, in, in 2020. But it came out and I found a copy and I bought it and I got to go pick it up when I'm back in Florida right. from, a, uh, from right. a, a game store up in Orlando. So that literally happened two days ago, that whole story. So there you go, everybody. A board game family asks, and they're at board game family, why is Ignacy so worried about his English? Yeah. One reason I love board games and their personalities is specifically that it is international. It is great to hear people around the world talking about the subject of games. It is equally great to hear their international internationality expressed in their communication. It's not just a whole bunch of Americans only. Yeah, we've got people from Europe, Asia, and now Africa, and South America. It's great to hear from people around the world. I specifically like Ignacy being Polish and bringing Polish idioms to the discussion rather than hearing a typical American saying, you won't believe this. <laughs> I have learned a new expression from Ignacy. Be with me. I love hearing this new expression and have started using it. Please continue to use Polish saying, Slavic outlooks, and non-perfect English. It's fantastic. It brings us together in this world. I love it. Less of a question there, but more of a kind of a statement about the wonderful international thing that is board gaming. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate kind words. Uh, I will have problems with my English uh, for the next 20 years, but if it doesn't matter for you, I'm very happy. So yeah. thank you for and, that. And I think, I, I mean... I, we might as well say, I think your English has, has even gotten better just, you know, over the last several years. I mean, it's always been fine in communication, but you were, I remember you saying when we recorded that first episode that you weren't sure we were going to go through with this in the long term. 
where you had to get through a couple of episodes before you said, okay, and you listened to yourself again, you said, okay, I think it's good enough, but I think it's gotten better. I think your pronunciation, everything. And you even say Amazon right now. So that's a really good thing. <laughs> All right, everybody, let's get over to play testing. So what do we have this week, Ignasi, uh, you asked, do you buy board games as holiday gifts? What's your strategy when buying games as gifts? Is it buy evergreens, the newest and hottest, the games you own and love, games you played when people visited, so you bought it for them? What did our fans come back and say? What's their strategy? In general, uh, of course, we never counted this, but in general, in general, uh, uh, the feedback was that you don't buy the board games to the, your close ones if you know that they are not playing, they will not enjoy this gift, you don't want to, you know, put too many games in their lives if they don't need them. So this is uh, this is actually the right strategy. For the pr precise uh, uh, answers that I liked, uh, what, what I, here we have Justin Henry said, I find kids are much easier to buy for. I recently got Santorini and the kids haven't put it down since. Currently under the tree is a copy of SideQuest. I just know they will love it. And after that, there is a, the initiative and a host of dexterity games or pretty much anything from Haba. So this is a great idea to teach your kids young and put these modern board games as a gift for the kids because kids love games anyway. But right. if they start, pl start playing uh, these interesting uh, modern uh, board games that will, will win these uh, uh, Kinder Spiel des and instead of playing these uh, Monopoly and other crap, they will play some <laughs> modern, amazing, cool kids' games. It is much more likely that as a teenager, they will still play board games, and then as adults, they will be one of us. So this is a perfect strategy. I applaud this idea. And the other question that I picked, the other answer I picked is from Valentin Creton. And he said, I'm buying only for myself. No one in my entourage would play them and they would just gather dust. So he's realistic. He's a kind of Slavic. He says, I'm not buying board games for them. I will buy for myself. <laughs> it's the perfect way. So uh, I, I love it. He said also, I'm also often asked for recommendations at work. So people know which games to give for people. So this is also cool. Be ambassador of our hobby. Be this guy in the office that knows the games and can recommend is also very cool. So at least that way we can promote our hobby. Very, very cool. John Mill Miller Holes. He uh, says, occasionally we have bought board games as gifts and usually games that the receiver has expressed interest in often after playing our copy. So that was exactly one of the kind of ways we mentioned. Like, so you play something with somebody, they're not a gamer, like, oh, this is kind of cool. I could see myself, boom, you buy them, buy it for them, right? You turn them into a gamer like that. Um, Vincenzo Alvarello, former buddy from New Jersey, now lives up in uh, the cold Minneapolis. He says, I used to buy games for my cousins since they were non-gamers at the time. They've since grown up into games and I'll buy them less games. But if I see something that really screams, wow, I'll get it. If I could get Scout for sure by Christmas, I'd buy a case of it and give it to everyone. Finally played this weekend and wow. Vincenzo, that's what I said when I first played that game. And uh, like Corey Thompson, he literally bought them by the case from Japan and just started handing it out. He was at least in part responsible for this game getting as big as it has gotten. If you haven't tried Scout, you really have to. Peter Tierney, thanks for uh, giving us um, some an answer, Peter. I bought games for my nieces and nephews that I thought would like them, but I had no luck with that. This year, I did buy one game that I thought my nephew would like, but cleared it with him that he wanted a board game first. I am also planning on buying Parade for one of my nieces since she loved it and requests to play it and Pokemon cards for one of my nephews as requested by my brother. So we've got we've got people who do it. A lot of uh, a lot of people out there will be buying uh, buying games for people. And uh, I hope um, I hope you you can create new gamers over the holidays. My question to you for the, this week is going to be, will you do more or less board gaming over the holidays? Will you play more light, like family games, or will you try to get the big games to the table on your days off? And I'm going to add onto this whole thing. Which games do you think you'll play? So there we go. Um, 
Ignasi, what is your kind of strategy there? This is a super simple question, sir. Super simple? Super simple. I yeah. will play a lot of board games during a holiday. I will more. Play more lot, than you normally play. Yes, I will play okay. the whole day. And uh, I will I will pick uh, with my wife Mary uh, the longer game. So that when we have a time that we can uh, you know have a breakfast uh, and then put the game and play for for five uh, hours the longer game that you don't have a time for that yep. during the weekdays. So all the big boxes uh, we land most likely we will play some legacy games. So during the holidays you can finish the whole game uh, playing for instance ten games of of one title. I precisely remember that uh, last holiday, or maybe it was two years ago, uh, but during the holidays, we played the whole Eons and Legacy. Brilliant exp- experience. I love which, Eons End. Which game? Eons End. Oh, Eons End Legacy. Okay, very good. That Maybe your English is amazing, not that good. Yes, Aeons End. Game. Amazing, <laughs> amazing, <laughs> amazing <laughs> game. So, yeah, most likely something heavy, uh, maybe Legacy style. And yes, I will be playing a lot of board games during the holiday. Right. And uh, I'm going to to also I mean, yes, it's a it's it's kind of a simple question. I think most people are going to answer it in the yes, more games. But, you know, we get so busy over the holidays. Sometimes it, it's just you, you can't. Uh, this year, Paula and I are spending the holidays alone in Florida. Um, even my brother who lives close by, he's going to be up in Atlanta at his other place, um, seeing his his kids up there. So we're not going to have uh, anybody else. But I'm going to be inviting some people over, like maybe people from the Dice Tower in, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, like my friend Rod Phelps and Carrie Phelps that come over. And I know I'm going to get in more gaming than usual. And I'm going to play bigger games. I'm really going to try to get War of the Ring to the table over the holidays. I know Roy Canaday has been Jones in a play again. Rod Phelps has not played ever. So he really wants to play. So we're probably going to get one of these. Uh, to the table. Bonus, by the way, challenge of the week, we're going to put this right into the question, is that um, I'd like to challenge you to try to get some non-gamers into the hobby this holiday season by playing some light games with them. So that's your challenge. We're going to actually, Ignacy's going to insert that into the question right now. And in fact, he's going right now. He's creating the thread for you to answer this question about how much gaming are you going to get and what kind of games do you think you'll play while you're um, at the holiday season time. Meanwhile, <laughs> as he coughs in my ear, let's get to the final score. Thank you so much for listening. Help us spread the word about this podcast by telling your friends to download Board Games Insider wherever they like to get their podcasts, or you can now watch Board Games Insider on the Pod Father of Gaming YouTube channel. Do you want to be part of this episode? You can just ask us questions for our strategy and tactics segment by posting them in the correct thread in our guild on Board Game Geek, and also answer our question to you from our playtesting segment by also going to the guild on Board Game Geek and looking for the thread with this episode's question. Check out our websites, which are portalgamesus.com and podfathergaming.com. We're all over social media, so interact with us there, please. On Facebook, please like our pages, which are slash Board Games Insider slash Portal Games US and slash Podfather Gaming. You can speak directly to Ignacy and Steven on Twitter and Instagram. It's at Portal Games US and at Podfather Gaming. And the very active YouTube channels are Portal Games Movies, Portal Games Gameplays, and The Podfather of Gaming. On TikTok for Ignacy, it's Portal Games US. We really would love to see you in person at an upcoming convention in 2023. So if you come to any one of the ones we talk about, please do find us and let's chat. We live for this. We really do. Board Games Insider was professionally edited by Matthew Jude from This Game is Broken podcast, as he's done for the past several years. Thank you so much, Matthew. We will be announcing our new editor to you all very soon, like maybe in about five seconds or so from now. Also, that great voice you hear doing our intro, outro, and in-between segments is that of Ray Greenlee. He can be contacted to do voiceover work at raygreenleevoiceover.com. Ignacy, I have some news down here at the bottom, which I may have just hinted at. Might have given a little spoiler that I was going to do this. Our new podcast editor is Joshua Bowman, from Tabletop Submarine Podcast. Josh and Andrew Stiles have a great podcast called Tabletop Submarine, 
Marine, where they do deep dives into board games and have creatives in the industry on their show. They actually had me on for some reason recently. We had a great, great conversation about the history of Stronghold and then my role now in the industry. I highly recommend you checking them out wherever you like to get your podcasts or online at the URL tabletopsubmarine.podbean.com. And that has that's a wrap, Ignasi. Another great episode. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being with us. Remember to visit portalgamesus.com every single day. Every and day. And <laughs> Thank Ignacy, you, everybody. And ignacetrivicek.com, obviously. Obviously that, if you can spell it. Three, 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 three articles a week. Oh, really? Really. I'm, I'm keeping the pace, yeah. Every, every Monday, every Wednesday, every Friday, a new article. And you now don't have time to record this podcast. I'm a writer, sir. You're a creative. Be creative with me. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Take care.